We're on. Right, welcome back. Thank you for all turning back up again. Um, okay, so we're on with 187, urgent care pressures, um, and that's Kate. Thank you, and morning everyone. Um, so this is a verbal report, and I'm going to cover three areas. So first of all, the November position in respect of urgent care. Uh, secondly, the mobilisation of the winter plan, a progress report of where we're up to with that. But also then thirdly, I'm just going to touch on the stepping up uh, to level four, the national incident. The letter came out last, last week. Um, so first of all, in terms of November urgent care, so the four hour standard was 75.4% for, for the trust, um, better at FGH and worse at uh, Lancaster. Uh, and this is actually a slight improvement on October. Attendances have remained above the pre-COVID levels and an ambulance turnaround time has actually improved in November. Uh, so it's still above where we want it to be, but it had improved down to 33 minutes. Um, but the percentage that's actually completed within the 15 minutes has improved. So absolutely the right direction. Uh, there were 202 12-hour trolley waits in November, uh, the vast majority of which are um, waits for medical beds, uh, as would be expected and from previous reports. Um, but looking at actually what's happening to patients within ED, the average time to be seen has improved. The average time uh, in the department for non-admitted patients, so people who then go home, has improved. Um, and But the average time in the departments for those that are going to be admitted has not improved, that's extended. Um, bed occupancy has remained very, very high. Uh, the average is 95%, um, but uh, this includes the elective beds. If you look at our non-elective stream, that's way over 95%, and uh, people who've been on call will know that's frequently 100% at Lancaster every morning. Um, so if you just summarise all, all of that, attendances remain high. Uh, we are improving that interface with the ambulances, which is good. Um, and we're improving the time in the department for non-admitted. But with that high occupancy, um, that is resulting in so many more patients waiting. Um, so if I just flip to our winter preparations, um, so all of our out of hospital beds have been mobilised now uh, and additional staffing on the rotors have also been mobilised. Um, work is continuing on some of the initiatives within the urgent care plan around same day emergency care um, and the in hospital sharper ward and board rounds to really be minimising delay whilst patients are in our uh, beds. Uh, big focus on discharge. Uh, the RLI, the new patient assessment discharge uh, unit, the PADU, is up and running uh, and very successful. And at Barrow, the new ambulatory care unit is open and again, very successful. Uh, elective care is continuing uh, throughout the period at the moment. Uh, there have been um, some patients have been cancelled for lack of beds, but we haven't taken down elective wholesale or anything. So these are just odd, odd, the odd patient through the week. Um, and we are seeking to protect that super green pathway at all times because it is so important that those um, patients coming through. Uh, the stroke ward, so the beds on Huggett are up to 32 and are ring fenced along with ward six over at Barrow. And there are very strict rules about if we're going to break that ring fence um, for non-stroke patients. Um, the work to recruit staff to hospital home care continues. However, it's very, very evident that the care sector um, is really struggling and more work needs to be done on that. So lots of good progress with the winter plan, but despite all this mobilisation, the not meeting criteria to reside numbers are uh, going up and up. Uh, they reached 106 uh, on Thursday or Friday last week. Um, and as a consequence, um, despite all those interventions, the occupancy is remaining really high. So in December, we've seen a, a continued pressure at the, at the front door and through the hospital. And again, particularly, but not exclusively, but particularly at Lancaster. Um, and whereas previously, beginning part of the week, it would be really highly pressured. You have a bit of a reprieve as you went through Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That is not happening. And every week we've noticed it's just getting that little bit tighter and, and pressures increasing. Um, and that's really um, it, it's almost that, you know, 12 hour breaches um, when after a decision to admit 
uh, has been made, it's almost becoming commonplace, which is just not not, not acceptable. So. Um, given that rising pressure, over the last couple of weeks we've had some additional focus and we've put that on reducing the not meeting criteria to reside, particularly focusing on home first. So we, we know that the local authorities are really struggling uh, with the care sector recruitment. So we've had a sort of call for action internally for volunteers and for people to be either do additional shifts or to be redeployed for part or, or all of their job. Uh, to increase the numbers that we can then support at home. We're looking after these patients anyway. Let's look after them in the right place at home. Um, the community care group are running mini maids, so very much on a focus of pulling the, those patients and, and looking at alternatives to what we would normally do for, for those um, that cohort of patients. We've reinstated the five day frailty intervention team at the front door of RLI. Um, and that links very much to the patient story we heard earlier. And we know that that's a really good service. And I'll come back to that shortly when we talk about level four step up. So that's been in place for the last couple of weeks. Um, staffing only allows us at the moment to do that five days a week and for not a full day. But regardless, it's having a good impact. Um, we're looking at if what we call streaming plus at the front door at Lancaster. So people who don't need to be in an emergency department, can we stream them away? Um, we stream currently to Morecambe and Kendall urgent treatment centres, uh, but it's quite a few people don't want to go that distance. So we're just exploring actually if we had something down the road a bit closer, would that be effective? And that would have the real positive impact of decongesting the ED department. Um, We've also uh, looking at our bed optimization across the three sites to make sure we're getting the best use of all of our beds. Uh, and so that's requiring a bit of a reconfiguration at Lancaster. And, and a lot of this is linked to the IP, the, the, the colour coding that we have through our wards as well. But this um, also includes um, very importantly, a shift of elective work up to Kendall. Uh, so we're currently pulling um, a proposal together on that. Um, we're planning to open Ward 1 at Lancaster as a surge ward. Um, and of course, we're doing our usual daily push of all the people who just need to go home uh, and making sure that we have discharges early in the day. Um, so there's a lot going on with that. Then we come to the uh, level four letter that arrived last week. Um, so this is a, a declaration of the level four national incident and it's in recognition of the of the impact obviously on the NHS of both supporting the vital increase in the vaccination programme and preparing for a potentially significant increase in COVID-19 on the Crohn cases and a wave that's anticipated in um, January. So in the letter um, it very helpfully spells out a number of actions that trust um, providers need to take which include um, ramping up the vaccination programme which we touched on earlier uh, so in addition to seeking all the volunteers, we've uh, changed the model slightly so we can shorten the appointment times, which really helps with that, that, that doubling up of capacity that's needed uh, through to the end of December and probably into January as well, um, so that we can be delivering 44,000 jabs each week. Um, should just note that through those hubs, we've uh, delivered 230,000 vaccinations and the PCNs are, are way over about 650,000. So it's a really good programme uh, across the bay that's been delivered. Um, but we are seeking volunteers to continue to help with that ask. Um, and lo lots of people are coming forward for that, so it's really good. Um, the second part of it is to maximise the availability of COVID-19 antiviral treatments. Um, so we were asked to commence this last week, which we have done. Uh, so this is for um, patients who are at highest risk in the community. So they're triaged and um, these antivirals prescribed. So that is operating now. Uh, and we have had patients through the weekends as well. So these are small numbers, but um, very good to be doing this. The third area is maximising our capacity across both our acute and community settings. So basically um, home for Christmas. 
uh, is a shorthand for, for this really. Um, and then ask to halve our numbers of not meeting criteria to reside by, by Christmas. Um, so for that, just to get this in context, that's taking us from 100 to 50 across Bay by Friday. It's an absolutely massive ask, um, but we're working on that and that there are action plans around that. Um, very, very challenging to deliver this, but encouragement to think of alternative ways of doing this, use of personal health budgets, use of hotels, use of hospices, use of the independent sector capacity um, and um, encouraging virtual wards and uh, hospital at home models, which of course is our home first model. Um, so good. a lot of the actions that we're taking are in line with this. There, there isn't much that's new in there, but a uh, bit of a push to get that uh, getting done. Um, so within that, we've also secured some more additional out of hospital beds. Cumbria Local Authority have helped us with some beds at Parkview in Cumbria, um, and there, we're exploring some other independent care homes um, uh, and exploring with other care providers that are off framework and which we wouldn't normally go to. Uh, so, you know, even though in some cases it's it's um, ones or twos, every little will help with this. Um, the fourth area is about um, supporting patient safety in the urgent care pathways and uh, the key message in this is really to make sure that you know we're um, good on our ambulance handover delays we're delivering against the two-hour rapid response uh, which we are on target to do from early January uh, there's quite a lot in these actions uh, a big message in here is about continuing to deliver elective care uh, and ensuring that the highest clinical priority patients continue to be uh, priorities prioritised and treated. Um, and that's as, as, as far as possible as we can. Um, and it is recognised that the requirement to release really staff for the vaccination programme uh, and respond to the potential increase in COVID-19. Um, and they do underline the fact that a key feature of plans should be the separation of elective and non-elective, which I think with the plans we've got to move more elective up to Kendall uh, absolutely supports that. Um, so there's quite a lot going on with that. Uh, we've pulled together the case to develop the frailty fit to seven days, but also that case to uh, move el more elective up to Kendall. And that is going through uh, I IMT this week. Um, there is a section on here recognising the need to support staff to do the workforce planning. Um, so, you know, what are we doing? We've got that continued focus on uh, staff health and wellbeing. Uh, recruitment team are fast tracking key appointments. Um, the workforce cell is, is back in place and monitoring absence. I'm sure David can uh, tell us a lot more about all of these things. Um, the final area is the emergency planning element. So this is about ensuring that our surge plans and processes are ready to be implemented. Um, so this is instant coordination. So we've never stepped down our SAG and IMT arrangements. Uh, we've just they've been on a sort of low burner uh, two days a week. They're back up to five days. I fully anticipate them being back up to seven days after uh, the Christmas holidays. Um, we are required to uh, review and test our surge plans. So the teams have been doing that. Um, and, and you know the, there isn't a lot of information or modeling data available yet. We hope some more will come through this week. But we are, have um, completed some scenario planning for, uh, and this is uh, against the January 21 wave, so the, the second wave. Um, so we're planning to get 60% of that wave, 100% of that wave and 200% of that wave. And we're also having to factor in some scenarios around workforce absence, 20%, 30%, 40%. And these are huge numbers. Um, so working through that at the moment, but um, that means extra wards. That means eliminating not meeting criteria to reside. It means about reconfiguring uh, a lot of our beds to respiratory uh, and COVID. Uh, and at some point in that sort of escalation through the 60, 100, 200 percent, probably just short the 100 percent, we would have to be um, considering cancellation of elective. We can't keep doing everything when actually we're turning beds into respiratory beds. Um, so uh, I think we're uh, ahead of our, our, the planning on that, doing um, good work there. Um, and we wait to hear 
for modelling uh, and perhaps what the Prime Minister might say this week around further restrictions. That's all from me. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'll come to Aaron first and then we'll go to Steve and Richard. Thanks, Kate. An, an awful lot there to update the board on in, in what's been quite a busy week, I think, for the leadership team and the executive. Uh, that letter only arrived last week. Um, I'm not sure if we did this, but we helpfully took those six asks in the level four national letter through a series of quite structured slides into our trust management group on Wednesday of last week. So everyone was very clear on the ask and the response from us. Um, I would ask that that's also circulated to board colleagues for reference. So as we start to take decisions through our um, IMT infrastructure, as I said earlier, colleagues can see the reference to which the guidance is giving us that kind of permission or authority to take those decisions forward. Um, the other thing just to note for board is that the level four escalation means the cellular structures that were in operation through the early waves of COVID are now being stood up again across all regions and ICSs nationally, which means the decision making and the autonomy for some decisions now sits within the cells as it did in some of the earlier waves. Um, so that infrastructure is also being stood up, the common vernacular at the moment, to match kind of what's happening in each organisation, sort of five days a week on, on how the cells are operating. Um, and the two cells that we had in operation, the out of hospital cell and the in hospital cell are coming together. So the system leaders across primary care, mental health, community and acute can be in the same space when we're making decisions, particularly they're going to be fast moving, I think, in response to what the situation looks like operationally and clinically. So we will circulate the slides if we haven't already done so from Trust Manager Week Wednesday. So as a reference point to the um, updates that Kate's just given and just the recognition of the cellular structures that are in place also. Kate, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say we're very happy to circulate those slides, but we're also just updating our COVID response plan as well, specifically for the Omicron way, which will have all of this detail within it. Okay, to be able to circulate the two together, so four colleagues have got a reference point together. Uh, yes, as soon as I get it finished, which might be a couple of days before we get that finalised, the second year, the plan. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so we'll go to Steve, Richard, and then Jill. Sorry, Jill, I, you, I noticed your hand, but then it'd gone off. So I'll come to you at the end if that's okay. Um, th thanks, Kate. I just wanted to congratulate you and all your team on working on this phenomenal challenge. Um, as you know, we recently had a, a weekend in the life of the RLI at the Finance Committee, which sort of brought some of it to light. Richard and I had a tour of uh, surgery, including ICU, during the week uh, last week at RLI, which was an eye opener. I suppose I just wanted to get reassurance that in that surge planning, and Aaron may have touched on it, the link and the objective criteria for diverting and, and mutual aid is actually clear, and that that decision making is, is already pre done, if you like, so that you don't have to have long conversations when you get to points where it's obvious that there's an overload. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. That's that's a sort of um, a normal part of our escalation now and operation through the daily gold command cells, the, this infrastructure that we have, where we will be talking about mutual aid uh, and uh, brilliant collaboration across the trust, I've got to say, on on that, uh, which can be very, very difficult. Um, and, and the diverting, um, yes, uh, NMAS are in the middle of that and are increasingly finding it difficult to support requests to divert uh, because they have the same workforce issues as, as we do. They have the increased number of ambulance calls and everything. So everybody's stretched, but where they can do it and where we can offer help to other trusts and vice versa, that is happening. Thank you. So, Jill. Oh, nothing for me. Nothing for you. Okay, so Jill. I just wanted to say I did a visit to the urgent treatment centre the other day, and um, I was really pleased to hear from Alan that this whole um, system thing is being worked together as a system because 
the urgent treatment centre at Kendall really does want to help ED as more as much as possible, but they're having people um, being told by GPs, receptionists, will get your dressing changed um, at the urgent treatment centre because we're too busy here, or there aren't dis uh, practice nursing here, and the, and those issues were going to be picked up after my visit there because that really isn't acceptable. They they need to focus on helping ED and not picking up. Uh, work that should be done by practice nursing, there needs to be another solution for that. Thank you, Jill. Adrian? Thank you. I mean, thanks, Kate, for, for the update and just the, the scale and pace that you're implementing the change. It's absolutely fantastic to hear that. Um, my question was just uh, about the move of elective activity up to Kendall. And I visited it oncology recently. They've gone through that relocation. Um, and it was really about the uh, staff consultation and also the staff are, are experienced increased travel to work times and increased travel to work costs and just whether these uh, are possible to factor in given the, the the pressures that are on you in the tire scales to actually implement the, the changes. Thank you. Yes, um, the, the shift of more elective work to Kendall is a little different from the, shift, the temporary shift of oncology uh, last year where we picked up the whole service lock, stock and barrel uh, and moved it uh, by necessity to get it onto a green site. Uh, this is more about uh, utilising the theatres with more lists. Um, the, the surgical teams are ab absolutely behind it. So in, instead of having a list once a fortnight at Lancaster, an individual may have more lists up at Kendall. Uh, they're very supportive of it. The, the limiting factor has been the sort of the, the enhanced uh, nursing support and care at post surgery. Um, so we're just working through that. Um, this would be something that we think we could do quite quickly in January to a limited extent, but that would help Lancaster. Um, but there also might be um, bizarrely, it's just the way the beds are configured, uh, more elective work over at Barrow rather than Lancaster as well. So it, it, it is about uh, using our resources uh, as best we can through that that wave period. But then as we go forward, it would be a, a much bigger shift of work up to Kendall, in which case if we require consultation or the rest of it, absolutely, we would be doing that. We bring Dave in, because I think you're going to respond to that, uh, the staff. It was just to say that we, we do work very, very closely with our um, union staff side colleagues and, and the trade unions, particularly in these things where we're having to move at, at, at a pace which we wouldn't normally have to have to follow. So we in such scenarios, we involve our trade union colleagues right at the very start and work, work with us. Um, we work with national terms and conditions uh, wherever, wherever possible that do allow some of those uh, uh, issues such as Adrian was talking about to to be covered the, the there's a you know there's a really comprehensive set of national terms and conditions we do work within albeit if we do need to look to vary to reflect some local circumstances we do try and come up with a local plan but we try and work within the national where, where possible but we honestly we could not do this without the support of people like Sue and her colleagues on on the trade unions that work hand in hand with us to, to help deliver Thank you. Chris, have you got it? I think that just um, that some of the things Kate said and, and the possible further actions that could be taken depending on the scenario modelling clearly are at best put in um, additional risk in terms of the H2 plan that was submitted only a few weeks ago. But um, uh, and um, what we I, I should say we're not we've not yet had any guidance around uh, any dates around uh, the financials for the second half of the year um uh, of course as that changes we'll we'll advise but uh, clearly the, the, this is a, a departure from some of the assumptions that were made or there are risks that are now greater again some of those assumptions thank you chris um, um from myself i, I think I was really pleased to hear Kate that um, recognising that the issues with social care that the, the system has for once rather than sat back and, and waited for a solution 
worked on a solution, that realizing the, the issues there weren't going to be resolved quickly. So, so that's you know great to see the maturity there. Um, and I'm just going to throw this out there, but have we ever, con and, and obviously we can't discuss it here now, um, but have we ever considered putting a UT, um, an urgent care treatment centre into RLI to? Um, that that is one of the that is the consideration. So whether you call it a walk-in centre, walk-in pod, something temporary, um, now's now's a great time to test it. Yeah, because most very busy EDs do have them, don't they? Sat alongside mm -hmm. to stream patients into. So they do, and, and patients yeah. want to always be streamed over to Morecambe or up to Kendall, particularly up to Kendall. It's quite a long way. Yeah, well, a lot of people that will, will trap up won't have the transport, <coughs> will they? Either so. Mm -hmm. It's something I think we, we need to explore and explore quickly. OK, so we're asked to note the report um, and I'm not seeing any more hands, so we'll, we'll move on. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, so we're now going to move to the minutes and 3A reports from the Assurance Committee. So we'll go to Steve first mm -hmm. and then to Jill for quality. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jen. Uh, all I was going to do is just give an update from our last committee meeting was actually on the 16th of this month and, and really Chris just trailed the, the issues I was going to raise. The alerts, if you like, from that report were that we're already seeing in the first two months of the second half of the year pressure in the care groups. Uh, so their underlying costs are higher than had been assumed in the half two plan that's been submitted to the ICS. Uh, pockets of Inefficient use of bank staff and some issues in estates expenditure were highlighted. But I guess the big message is we face a very significant staff cost pressure in this last uh, period of the financial year. Uh, and the level four uh, letter is not going to help at all. So it's that request for additional staff alongside or additional capacity alongside difficulties around staff absence are going to be a very real pressure for us towards the end of the year. So those were the main uh, alerts from the Finance Committee last week. Thanks. Jill, could we have the report from the Quality Committee, please? Um, if it wasn't with the papers, it will come out later, but everything we discussed at the Quality Committee has been reported here already. And as I said earlier, um, there are some actions on here, which I said earlier when I picked up, so there's no more we need to cover. Thanks, Jill. OK, so we'll move now on to item 188, Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Professionals Biannual uh, Staffing Report. Uh, Lynn, I think this is yourself. Oh, you're on mute, Lynn. Sorry. <laughs> So thank you, Chair. Um, so this paper is a current position statement on the safe staffing review, which has been taking place over the last few months. Um, once the incoming exec chief nurse, uh, Bridget Lees, is in post, she'll bring back an updated position to the January board. Um, the review has been led by Lorna Pritch. She's done a, an absolutely fantastic job and uh, she will now talk you through uh, the paper, just highlighting some of the process that we've been through. Thanks everyone. Am I okay to share my screen? Yep. Thank you. Hope you can all see that. We can, thank yep. you. So I'm going to just take you through some of the principles around the safe staffing report um, and, and sort of how, how the report came about really. Um, so the National Quality Board guidance was issued um, a number of years ago and it um, looks at this triangulated approach to safe staffing. Um, so the basis of this report is focusing around those elements of that triangulated approach. So professional judgment review, evidence based tools and data and then outcomes. So um, we looked at those three elements. Um, and um, the initial report that we're going to present today is just focusing on two of those elements, professional judgment and outcomes. The reason for that is that the evidence based tool data um, requires us to collect a number of um, acuity and dependency measures from all of the inpatient units within the organisation. So some training 
an initial data collection trial uh, is taking place at the moment. So we've trained uh, over 90 staff on the clinical wards and departments to collect the data and um, a couple of wards have already done some uh, collection of data for us. So we need to collect that data for 20 days and that is taking place in February of 2022. So uh, for the purposes of this um, paper we've got two pieces of the jigsaw puzzle uh, we've got the clinical outcomes which are our nurse sensitive indicators um, and we've got our professional judgments um, from our clinical leaders on those inpatient units so um the way that the review um works is to look at a number of metrics within our um workforce stream so we can gather some data um within this report um, around things like care hours per patient day. So that um, looks at the number of hours available for care in the clinical environments. Um, and it is a, a national tool that is used to support um, information uh, on the model hospital and allows us to benchmark ourselves against other organisations. <laughs> um, so there's a number of um, elements in relation to the care hours within the paper that can sit alongside that. So we, we try and compare the care hours per patient per day with the nurse sensitive indicators, for example, so you can see if there is any correlation uh, between the two. We've also looked at fill rates. So fill rates are the rates of fill of the shifts that we need um, on the clinical areas to remain uh, safe. Um, we have seen um, consistently at a trust level, those figures have appeared um, quite well sustained and above 90%. But when we have drilled down into the data, what we can see is quite a significant variation with some wards struggling to reach the 85% fill rate, uh, whereas some wards have overfilled their shifts because they've had higher acuity dependency and therefore demand. So the two have balanced us to a trust level figure that at first appearance looks good, but we have seen um, and identified a number of areas where we do have concerns in terms of those fill rates. Um, uh, something that contributes to that fill rate uh, variation is an increase in additional duties. So additional duties have been pus pushed into patient uh, into uh, ward rotors to support um, higher acuity or dependency. So that's the clinical teams making judgments at the time um, that that ward or department requires additional staffing to keep uh, safety for the patients and therefore they're um, at putting in additional shifts into the rotors that then need to be filled um, and that adds additional pressure to the staffing uh, levels on the unit, especially if those um, additional asks come at the last minute. Um, so higher sickness rates and um, issues with um, COVID isolation, for example, can often be that last minute ask that then um, the wards uh, clinical team struggle to, struggle to fill even with bank usage. Um, we look at um, things like unused hours and unavailability. So these are key performance indicators within our rostering system. And that's to make sure that we're making full use of the staffing um, capacity that we've got. So unused hours is hours that staff have been paid for but haven't actually been worked. Sometimes that happens when staff um, work um, particular shifts and then there's a few hours left over. We need to make sure that they're then accumulated so that they can uh, complete another full shift for us. So there's a lot of work going on with the care groups to make sure that that uh, number of unused hours is low. Um, and um, again, some benchmarking information that we've had recently from our allocate system has told us that we are doing pretty well with that and we, we're around uh, 5%, which is which is pretty good com in comparison to some of our um, other organisations. Um, in terms of unavailability, uh, these are the things like annual leave, paternity leave and sick leave, um, times when staff are unavailable for work. Uh, so we've had a few challenges in terms of unavailability. Um, the key one really is sickness and absence um, due to COVID isolation. It has been much higher than our um, budgeted headroom allocation. So the headroom allocation is, is the amount of um, establishment within the staff budget to allow us to account for sickness and we're, we're almost doubling that um, at the moment so that's um, causing a significant pressure and again additional pressure on the use of bank and agency staff. 
Um, Moving on to bank and agency usage, you can see from the report that we have had significant bank and agency usage um, in the previous 12 months and in H1 of this year. Um, that has been an accumulation of all the things that I've just highlighted really um, in terms of uh, higher demand, uh, increasing uh, additional duties um, and, and uh, challenges with unavailability of the staff that we have got. Um, our vacancy rates you'll see from the paper do look very good. Um, again, at first glance, what I would say is that because there's not been any um, significant formal establishment reviews for a number of years, that has led to that sort of falsely assured position that we have got a quite a low vacancy rate, but we do see that we are the demand in the system is, is much higher than those um, set establishments, uh, hence the need for those additional duties. Um, we've done some age profiling as well, so you can see from the report that we do have quite an aged population um, within our nursing and um, allied health and midwifery um, staff groups. Um, so we have to be mindful of that when we move into uh, our sort of forward planning and workforce strategy uh, for the next sort of five to ten years. In terms of nurse sensitive indicators, I've just listed those there on the screen so you can see that the, the types of things that we're looking at and these are the types of things that can be affected if staffing levels um, are not uh, as they should be. So there, there could be a correlation between them. So uh, it's good to compare them uh, with um, workforce metrics. So you'll see on Appendix 1 the care hours per patient per day are sitting next to those um, metrics there. They are at a granular level, so you can see them by ward. Um, that is purposeful because um, we we need to see them at that level because each ward is it has different need. Uh, if they are bundled into a sort of trust level figure, it can be again quite misleading. Um, and then the final part of the jigsaw puzzle is the professional judgment reviews. And this um, acknowledges really that the data can only give us so much and it can only tell us so much. And there is that judgment from the leaders of those inpatient units um, and um, the managers that can, can give the richness of how that actually feels, what their actual day to day challenges are and any sort of unit specific needs that can be identified. So the papers made a number of recommendations, um, quite a lot of that um, factors around consistency of approach in terms of the roles that we provide. So there is some quite large variation seen on the status of the ward managers, for example, or the non-clinical support workers cover or ward cat cover within the departments. So we're looking to try and standardise that approach and give a consistent um, standard for the staff to follow. Um, again, consistency um, with support services, sometimes um, cover from other departments can be um, challenging and then that often leads to the uh, to the nursing teams having to pick up some of that additional um, work, for example, when the, if there's um, domestic gaps in the afternoon, that's often down to the clinical team to then fill the gap for that. Um, I've, there's a very broad statement there, I've got improve absence management, if only it was that easy. I think there's some significant challenges around how, how we do that. It's looking at our policies and making sure that our um, managers can um, support absence management within, with their colleagues um, to make to incentivise presenteeism um, and make sure that we can improve that rate. Um, and I know that the Carter report is really clear that even if we can just reduce 1% of sickness, it would significantly improve our, our abilities to deliver um, safer staffing. I think there's um, a real focus on trying to get back to basics. Um, AHPs and nurses are notorious for picking up additional jobs and duties and um, sometimes that is to the detriment then of, of, of their core business and I think there's something about making sure that the extended roles that we take on don't, um, don't have that detrimental effect to our, our core care of patients. Um, maternity and paternity cover um, a standard approach to the support that staff get when um, to the wards um, if they do have people on maternity and paternity leave. Um, and we're also looking um, at the night and day shifts. And um, again, a strong recommendation is that um, the night staffing be uplifted to support um, patient care because the patient's um, acuity and dependency remains the same, whether it's in the day or in, at, at the night. 
um, and really just some business continuity arrangements to need to be strengthened for some of the really small and, small fragile, and fragile teams, teams that, we've got. that we've got. I can hear myself echoing, sorry about that. Uh, I think that's it, thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you, Lorna. So I think we're going to be inundated with questions now. So I'm going to go to Steve first and then we'll watch out for hands as they come up. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks to Lorna and Lynn for this very important report uh, for me. Um, I think I, there's lots of points I could raise, but I'm only going to pick one. Um, and that's really about assurance, I think. Uh, forgive me. Um, I've not seen this report before at the board. Uh, I understand from your report that the guidance is it should be six monthly um, and that it hasn't come to us. And, and that kind of prompts a wider question for me that clearly it's only guidance, but there are a number of areas where there has been guidance and the trust for whatever reason has, has not been following it. And I think as a board, uh, we should have better sight of those situations. Uh, and I wonder whether it's an area that the audit committee might look at, for instance, by just clarifying areas where, as a trust, we are consciously or otherwise not in line with national guidance or expectations. We had another one earlier in the meeting about uh, national expectations around maternity. So I think it's an area we should have better sight on. Uh, and then connected with that, I think this whole area of, of nursing staffing linked to uh, clinical incidents is something that would benefit from uh, subcommittee uh, regular examination rather than just coming to the board. So I think there are a number of things from an assurance point of view we should, we should think carefully about. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, and actually, the point about um, reviewing all the to ensure that we are meeting national guidelines and expectations on these kinds of reports. Paul, if you could take that to audit committee um, and we'll just add it as an, any other business, just a quick chat through in January. I'm going to come to Aaron and then I'll go to the hands that are raised on the screen. It, it's in response to that, Claire and Stephen's point. So that's exactly one of the themes that we've picked up through the Good Governance Institute work and one of the objectives through Richard's appointment is to ensure that our governance systems are pulling these things through mm -hmm. to forward board agendas, almost like um, like breathing as an organisation. It just happens that the drumbeat of these proposals come through to board as and when they should. Now, um, I would sponsor the audit committee and in, in, in the way that we said the methodology of sustainability should include our audit programmes. I think that's entirely appropriate. Um, we need to make sure also then that where we've got these forward reviews or the governance and assurance reports coming through to board, that we align enough time for scrutiny and understanding whether that's assurance committee or others to really understand the detail and what it is as a board we need to do with those reports. Because my reflection of national guidance reports in previous board roles is that they can be received a little bit like, well, this is this month and this is this quarter's and they get passed off. So we just need to spend a bit more time, I think, understanding what it means to bring those kinds of reports to board. Uh, a bit of, um, it's not assurance, but reassurance. The work that we've done on staffing, there's obviously been two years or two reporting cycles where ordinary business hasn't been kind of in our purview as much as it would have been without COVID with us. But the four times a day safety checks, the professional judgment, the fact that we expend somewhere in the order of 10 million pounds on bank and agency, there is evidence that the staffing levels on the wards and departments are being serviced based on the reviews that we've had, but we haven't got the assurance we need through the report. So just drawing the distinction for some reassurance and some assurance, uh, and the latter is preferable, obviously, of course, Steve. So we'll definitely pick that up. Thank you. So I'm going to go to, to Sarah and then Hugh. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so I think firstly, thanks to Aaron for the reassurance and Steve for raising that point about guidance, because that, that was something that had struck me as well. Um, thank you, Lorna, because that's an incredibly detailed report and it must have been a huge amount of work. So thank you very much um, and for presenting it in a way that we can understand as well, which I think is really important. 
Um, on that note, I had a question or a comment really around the appendix, um, appendix one at page 118, uh, 112, sorry. Um, it isn't clear to me from the report what good would look like and what a benchmark would be. So on the nursing sensitive indicators, clearly we, we know that lower is better um, and we can see where that trend is going the other way because the shades are darker. Um, but on the care uh, hours per patient day, we don't know what good looks like. So I would really appreciate if there could be some kind of indication of that in, in reports going forward. So we've got a sense of what we're aiming for. And then the other thing for me would be, I, I presume but that particular wards have been chosen because they're ones we want to be really careful about. It would be helpful to just have a line to that, what the focus of the care is in that ward. Um, and so as a, as a newer member of, of the board, uh, I'm not clearly cited on exactly what care is delivered in those different wards and I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Hugh? Yeah, so thank you for this. Uh, report. It's um, it fits very nice, nicely with the birth rate plus um, report from earlier. So um, uh, I wasn't quite sure when the last time that the trust, not that we'd seen it at the board, when the last time the trust had actually done this, because I picked it up that that might have been a, a a while ago, rather than the regularity that was recommended. So just some um, confirmation of that would be good. Um, but my my main my main question, which I think Aaron's T touched on was obviously the the, rec the, the boards the, the report seems to suggest that in a lot of areas um, we're we're a, we're probably understaffed uh, even though historically it would suggest from a while ago that we were okay but it's um, uh, because of a whole load of other things that have happened and then use of bank and such like it does suggest that that that, not, that that when we when we then when when this really washes out properly and you 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 finish it that, that that there's there 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 are more that we do need to invest in staff uh, on a permanent basis. What I wanted to check was the affordability of that and whether that actually was actually going to be mitigated by a reduction in the amount that we're actually spending on bank and uh, and uh, uh, you know additional staff and temporary staff in that way. So. Obviously, whether the, the, this act, is this actually does mean it's it's a zero zero gain, if you follow me, that it's not not really an, an, a negative financial in, impact on us on this, because obviously the staffing is staffing levels are absolutely key for us. Um, and uh, I, th I think the the other point that struck me, which was when I was starting to think about care hours per patient day, which I think picked up exactly the the point that that, that that's Sarah raised around. Uh, um, well, I don't quite know uh, from as well. Well, what is the right level? And obviously, you you probably do, or somebody somewhere probably does, unless it's still just a, being used as a benchmarking exercise nationally, and nobody knows what's right. But obviously, there are other things that actually impact on staff uh, that are outcomes of staffing, which is like if you've raised in this levels of incidents, and then there's the issue of what productivity of our teams and. And uh, you know, just increasing the number of staff doesn't actually necessarily mean it's a good thing because actually they're not. When we benchmark them, they're not actually terribly productive. But obviously, productivity in healthcare is a difficult thing to to get one's teeth into. So I think I'm raising a lot of questions here that probably the board isn't the right place to go into those in in depth. It's probably assur an assurance committee is that is the best place to go into those in depth. But those are the sorts of questions. That came up for me as I as I read this report, which I think is really important. And my very final question is: is Are we going to do is, is something underway for doctors and other st staff groups? Um, so, uh, so I've I've just thrown a whole load at you there, Lorna, and and Lynn. So I'm sorry, but um, uh, but not necessarily for answering here, but it, it just indicates the sort of stuff that that this sort of very important report raises. Thanks. OK, so I think Lynn's got a hand up to respond to that. And I noticed that Jane's also hand shot up. I assume Jane will come in at the end about doctors. About medical staff. OK, so uh, the timing here uh, it is probably about four years that a full report came to board. Um, but actually in between that, there's been a number of local um, staffing reviews. Certainly the care groups have been doing local staffing reviews. Um, uh, and uh, allied health professionals as well. This is the first time we've, we're pulling together a, a full report. Um, in future, that will come every every six months. Once we've got the first cycle over with in February, they'll, they'll come to board every six months. 
Um, you talked about this, the what the um, wards being understaffed. I think that's that's the main outcome of of the report. Um, but actually, the reassuring thing, in a way, is that the professional judgment of the ward managers has meant that they have been making sure that the staffing levels are safe, and that's indicated by the huge amount of bank spend, um, uh, which is very significant. Going forward, we would expect that, you know, with the investment into uh, sort of uh, permanent posts uh, at ward level, we'd expect the bank usage to come down. Um, I don't think we could ever get it to zero because you have fluctuations. And uh, I don't know whether um, Lorna might be the best person to um, mention about the care hours per patient day, about what is the right level. I think in the first place, you've got to make sure that only the, the, the correct staffing is including that care hours per patient day. And what Lorna um, highlighted is that there's a number of staff in there, like supervisory staff, supernumerary staff, that have actually skewed the figures. So it's been an amazing piece of work um, and it's really got us right down to the the sort of benchmark around where we need to start from and how we need to sort of improve going forward. So I don't think you want to add anything to that, Lorna. Yeah, um, I can do. Um, thanks. Just in terms of the care hours per patient day, it is quite difficult to benchmark, um, I'm afraid. And that's kind of why they sit in isolation as individual departments, because they have their own individual specifics and specified requirements so it is hard to pick um, what it should be for that department so you can't say all wards should be at x level um, and if you look on the model hospital system um, the only kind of valuable current benchmarking tools sit around the standard trust level figures um, which again for for the trust, we look pretty good. We sit in the upper quartile, so around 10 care hours per patient day on average, nine to 10, which is it, which is quite good. But you'll see from that um, appendices, we, we've, we've got a variation from five care hours on some wards up to, you know, 45 on some of our very small units where the care hours can be really high because the um, the, the fragility of those services and, and the very small nature means that you have to have a huge number of staff ratio to patients, which pushes the care hours really high. So it's one of those, again, that we have a big breadth, um, which sometimes um, doesn't always show the detail that we would need to see. So I hope that helps. It does help. It just, uh, I think, it just highlights the the, the difficulty in, in 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 this. I mean, I, I think sometimes it's a use for it internally, isn't there? That we can use it internally, and and then and historically looking at if um, suddenly one service has been at a certain level and it's starting to fall, it's starting to go down, and yeah, I, I, it just highlights the, the the difficulty in at very high levels using this sort of data because it hides so much so much stuff yeah. underneath it, and and you're not comparing apples with apples a lot of the time. So thank thank you for that. Thank you, Jane. Would you like to respond on this? <laughs> yeah, I, I'd already um, asked if HR could look into it because I don't think there's a specific single tool that's useful, um, uh, but I think it is something that needs doing because obviously workload um, capacity band changes an awful lot over time. Uh, it becomes more complex because of course we've extended roles and so it won't just be purely doctors. We'll have extended practitioners, etc. But but some places have managed to do it um, and we probably just need to uh, find out what everywhere else has done. But but yet yeah, something that I've already said is it something that would be high on my list of priorities. Good. Thank you, Jane. And definitely pinch with pride. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, I'm going to bring Chris in. Well, obviously, there are, there are a few things there uh, linked possibly as well to, to what you said. So, you know, it isn't just about bank. We need to understand the outcomes that we would expect as a result of the implementation of these recommendations and, and be as rigorous and um, as committed in terms of securing the, the um, uh, benefits of those, but also tackling the inefficiencies. Uh, it, <clears throat> we've got to be as good at that as we are at putting things in, otherwise it, it doesn't achieve, achieve what we need. So looking at how we deploy our resources um, and uh, one thing uh, that we've increasingly found, there are a number of things that have come out of this review that are, are, uh, are, con are consistent with the um, development of our um, understanding of workforce costs for our uh, financial improvement programme as well. So 
which is going to um, be as as good at good as 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 we go through to implementation. I just um, I did have one question for Lorna. Is that um, obviously we we'll get alongside and make sure all the financial modelling work is done appropriately, and we'll take that through the finance committee. But what what is the next step, uh, Lorna, from your perspective? Um. <laughs> Obviously, the data collection is paramount and key, really, because at the moment we only have, as I say, those two pieces of the puzzle um, and the professional judgment can only tell us so much. We do really need the data to to sort of balance that professional judgment out, because, again, I think there will be people who have, have asked and had us put a significant ask in, people who've put a very small ask in and the data should help us to kind of um, meet the two uh, appropriately in the middle. Um, and I think the other thing that we we are doing is that there will be a kind of the monthly rolling report that that also needs to come through a, a sub level committee as well, and um, that will help us to monitor uh, more regularly than, than this report can. So for me, they're the two things. Thank you. Um, Lorna, just a couple of things from myself. I was really pleased to hear you reference the fact that patients don't get less poorly at night. So thank you for that acknowledgement. It's one thing that I've always wondered about over the years, why staffing seems to be at a bare minimum overnight. Um, we know, so the last time this was done about four years ago, we know since then that um, there's more the build up of pressure within the system, the amount of um, the times that we are sitting at 85%, um, I always forget this word, occupancy. You know, we're, we're irregularly at 95%. Do we take that into consideration? And also the fact that we're now more, we're, we're more of a seven day service than five days a week and everyone clocks off and patients just sit and, you know, don't deteriorate over weekends. Has that all been played into this review? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what I would say in terms of the seven day service, um, the inpatient reviews, I think that that doesn't have much bearing because they should should and do provide service right through. Um, I think um, in terms of some of the community services that was identified and, and there are a number of recommendations from this paper that will support further business cases, for example, where services have been running um, over, over five, but really are needed over seven. Um, so, yeah, I think that will be picked up um, within those um, separate cases. Um, and, and yeah, it is really important. Thank you. Um, and just then to, to sort of um, follow up with, um, again, it's not only about, and you touched on about the acuity and the level of care that different awards because of their specialities deliver. How do we ensure that we've got the right um, staff on that work with the right skills? Because again, you know, we know that um, we've got a very aging workforce and particularly over the next couple of years, we're going to have a lot of nurses that retire. Um, and while some may do a return, retire and return an awful lot won't so what where's the sort of um plan for bringing either buying in more expertise or bringing um our new and less experienced nurses up to that level of, of their very experienced colleagues that have probably been on award for 20 25 years um I think I think with that um, the training allocation within the uplift for each ward and department is really important and actually having that um, visual and evidence so that staff are able to use that and draw down on that training element of their allocation of headroom is really um, you know maximizing that and maximizing the individual um, allocation of funding for training as well but I think um, what we can see at the moment is such a huge reliance on on bank and agency um which which we would hope would improve if we have that review of funded establishments so you've got permanent staff working in permanent areas so that they will get the on the job training as well which is just as important as the um you know um professionally externally validated training so i think there is something around you know if we minimise our temporary staff and maximise our our establishments and, and have some period of 
fixed stability for those wards and departments which covid hasn't really given us because they've had to move change footprints staff have had to work cross specialty and that's been really challenging to make sure that we maintain the skills of the colleagues on those on those wards and departments thanks Lola. and then one final thing from me um so we heard earlier about the, the shortage of midwives um across um the whole country um how feasible is it going to be to get um, all these additional staff in that we're going to need um, to really bring us back up to, to the required levels. <laughs> Notice you're smiling there. It's a difficult question, I imagine, to answer. I don't know if Tamsin's still on the call, but um, I, I can answer that sort of generally. So we we there's a we just mentioned it briefly in this paper, but there is um, we have got um, a, a business case in development in the very early stages around increasing our apprenticeship program. So that would be for allied health professionals, midwives, and nurses in in a number of different specialties, including sort of our hard to recruit things like pediatrics, um, and. Um, and midwifery which are our current challenges so we'll be looking to an increasing model of apprenticeship programs year on year for the next five years based on our staff turnover rates so we know our staff turnover rates are pretty good compared to the rest of the northwest so we can predict that my concern is that we cannot predict the retirement element which we, we know is a risk in the next few five to ten years so it's making sure that we've got that robust grow our own strategy uh, as well as maximising our international recruitment strategy so we've got a really established uh, international um, pipeline for nursing but we need to enhance it for midwifery and sort of specialist like paediatric nursing for example so that's still very much in its infancy in in the region um, but we are looking to um, start tentative steps into that as well um, Excellent. I think Dave probably wants to come in at that point. Well, I, I just want to congratulate Lorna because actually I, I've not felt the need to have to come in at all up mm. until up until this. So I think Lorna's done an absolutely terrific job. Just the one thing I want would want to say is in in terms of some of the projections, some of the some of the growth. We we aren't going to be able to just keep on recruiting new nurses, either international or train our own. And it's that workforce modernisation piece, which is what we really are going to have to grab hold of and really look at the new roles and look at redesigning services. And I know Lorna and Lynn are, are, are <coughs> well for that. And it will be one of the first tasks we're going to need to pick up with Bridget when she does come in as to how we maximise and optimise the use of those those new roles. But mm -hmm be a similar issue I think in terms of um, medicine as well you know with with Jane it's about how we how we really as part of our workforce planning think longer term about what it is we're going to do taking a five and a ten ten year view thank you Aaron? thanks chair just just a couple of reflections then so so we've talked about as a board the forward look of assurance on the six monthly report making sure that we've got the good oversight of assurance around staffing levels which we will pick up there's a so what question. So as we as we develop this piece of work, which I would agree, Laura, it's a fantastic piece of work. Thank you. We're going to be bringing some proposals in quarter four through the assurance committees, both workforce, finance and interboard on delivery. So once we've got that third piece of the jigsaw puzzle in place, kind of February, March time, we're going to be bringing in proposals here. My ask of particularly Bridget when she arrives, and I know Lynn will hand over and Dave, is that we've got some of these elements in that proposed plan so it's not simply flipping you know a bank or agency spend to permanent and getting permission to go out and recruit but we're going to be quite nuanced we're going to have to be quite nuanced in how we close some of those gaps so whether that's apprenticeships whether it's retraining whether it's using the provider collaborative board and the regional workforce infrastructure around new programs of education training development we need to push at quarter four really clearly so we know in 22 23 what our plan is going to look like not just that we have the permission to my argument is, is flip the spend to something a bit more kind of permanent on structures so um that's with the leadership team in particular with bridget and dave to bring back in quarter four yeah. thank you thanks richard 
Can I suggest there might be an extension to that in how we think about our equipment for our future workforce as well? We might want to think about different hoists mm -hmm. or different types of beds, things that make it less physically yeah. demanding on our staff to, to keep them safe and to also encourage older staff to stay with us. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, and an excellent paper. And I think it's provoked a, a lot of thought and questioning amongst ourselves. So thank you very much for that. Um, there are a number of recommendations. Um, I don't think we need to read them all out. Um, they're, they're listed and they're very quite um, detailed. Are we happy to accept the recommendations noted in the report? Yeah, okay. yeah. good to have a date on some of them. Definitely. Thank you. OK, so we'll move on to 189 integrated care system update, please. Thanks, Chair. So I gave some reflections of where the focus of the ICS and the provider collaborative board was in my chief exec's report. The only other two elements that I would highlight for board's attention uh, are on page 121 of 131, and that's the governance arrangements for the provider collaborative board. Um, so you can see the key priorities which you've agreed to before around the clinical strategy and then the associated estates workforce strategies that follow and a continued level of support for the recovery and restoration program and leadership development. So those are themes that we've talked about before. With the legislative changes that are proposed from the 1st of April, there's then the opportunity for the provider collaborative board to review its working arrangements, particularly in devolved autonomy and decision making. Um, so what was agreed at the board meeting last month is permission to seek advice then from um, legal input and also leadership from around the BCB as to what those options might be, whether they're um, suitable options to deliver what's in front of us and then what respective board's decision making would be as a result. So I want to highlight that with the board because in quarter four that is going to feature as part of some of our development work. And obviously with Mike and I represented at the PCB, we'll be working with board colleagues on what our recommendations or proposals might be on the back of that piece of work. Uh, the second point I will just mention is the subgroups and the SRO section of this report. So this is very much in the operating model or the wiring diagram, as I sometimes call it, under the PCB board. And a recognition that in order for it to execute those key priorities, it needs to be established differently with um, better resource and clearer lines of accountability and responsibility for key leaders. So you will see, we've circulated previously, um, the establishment of two subgroups, a clinical integration board and a uh, corporate collaboration board. The clinical integration board is chaired by uh, Professor Thomas, our chair, uh, and the uh, corporate collaboration board by Steve Fogg, who's the chair of Blackpool Teaching Hospitals. Um, those two bodies will drive the key work plans under the clinical strategy and the financial recovery largely, and we'll start to see over the coming months, increasing um, levels of decisions that need to be made in order for that strategy to be progressed. So to be welcomed, I think, uh, moving out of developmental discussions and COVID support into a more structured, uh, purposeful plan for the system in the future and some decision making that's going to come to board over the coming months. Um, and that's all I just want to update on. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? Steve? Just a very quick comment, I think, paragraph 20, that uh, across the system as a whole, 75% of the achievement of efficiencies was non-recurrent in nature. That was, we are not alone, I wrote on that pad. That's a good point, Steve, and I think largely if you look at the way that the Bay has delivered, um, I think we could hold our head up in comparison with others on what we've done as a group of partners and individually. Uh, the challenge remains that if those priorities are going to be delivered effectively, then recurrent savings and efficiencies need to be delivered. The proposal from the PCB is not out with of individual organisations' responsibilities. The focus on the clinical strategy and the corporate strategy are the systems offer to um, bring those efficiencies to the foreground more quickly than they currently are. Thank you. So we'll move on to item 190, um, which is change, um, a minor revision to the constitution for the Council of Governors. Um, Paul, can you quickly take us through this, please? 
Yeah, of course, Liz. Um, at the last meeting of the Council of Governors, permission was given to develop a small revision to the constitution related to the tenure of Council of Governors to make it clear that at the end of their term of office, they couldn't continue by uh, conveniently changing from one constituency to another one. Um, so there's an example actually given in the paper there about, uh, you know, possibly somebody coming to the end of their term of office, perhaps as say as a public governor or an appointed governor, and then moving to a different one to, to do that. Governors were really clear that they wanted a break after six years. Um, and to make that clear, we've, we've got a new clause there that we're recommending. We have uh, consulted governors uh, via email and all of the governors who responded were supportive of the proposed change. Power to change, the constitution sits with yourself, so we're asking the board to approve that on the basis of the uh, discussions that have been held with the council. Thank you. OK, are we happy to approve that change? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so this is now noted on the um, agenda, but um, uh, we're going to go to Lorraine um, for a verbal update as head governor. Is that okay, Lorraine? Hello, Lorraine. Oh, flickering. Yes, sorry about that. Um, it's just a, a few words that I wanted to say, really. And so thank you, Chair. Hello, everyone. And first of all, may I thank everybody uh, who helped me to decide to apply for the governor's role. Uh, and of course, also you voted for me. Um, my aim is to go forward, helping the trust become the best it can across the trust and not just certain areas. With the help and the support of the other governors, therefore, ensuring the safety and care of all our patients and all our staff. Um, these are extremely difficult times and we, as members of the Trust and the public, um, are really grateful to all levels of staff for the work that they have done over the last two years plus. Um, to finish, may I wish everyone a happy Christmas and a very healthy, happy and prosperous 2022. Thank you. Well said. Thanks, Thank Marie. you, Lorraine. I think we all echo those sentiments, don't we? OK, so attendance monitoring is there for all to note. Um, schedule of business, again, there to note, unless anybody has any specific questions or points. No? Um, any urgent business? I've not been alerted to anything, Liz. OK, Aaron, that's it. No, great. Thank you. So um, date and time of next meeting, uh, 26th of January, 10 a.m. Um, goodness knows what the world will be like then, but we can hope for, for better things. Um, so we're going to close the uh, public board meeting now um, and wish everybody a safe and well um, Christmas and all the very best for the new year. We're going to take a 15 minute break. So that's back at... Five two. Okay. Thank, Thank you all very Thank much. You. Thanks for your contributions. I think it's a very good debate. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.